Tangier. And now it will be, the rest will be in English. <laughs> it's a pleasure and honor to come and talk to you today about a topic that I think is of the highest societal importance. Okay, I can go it. Just a little background that uh, I've been doing research in automated reasoning now for 35 years. And for many, many years, my focus was publish papers, get them cited in good places, just the usual. But about five years ago, I got interested in societal consequences. And then about a year ago, I find myself in a press conference and a reporter from The Guardian asked, what jobs will not be automated? And I said, the conventional wisdom is the jobs that require extensive uh, human interaction, high emotional intelligence, and the like, that these jobs will not be automated soon. And then I added, kind of on the spur of the moment, but I'm not so sure, would you bet against sex robots? And the Guardian ran with it. And I was cited by about 1,000 newspapers on that. <laughs> and many of my friends told me that no one, no one will remember this. <laughs> Everybody will remember my comments about sex robots. <laughs> OK, now to a more serious note. So very often we attribute, uh, we talk about Alan Turing, this is the, his sculptures in Bletchley Park in the United Kingdom. And he is considered by many as one of the founding figures of artificial intelligence because of a paper he wrote in 1950 in which he discussed the possibility of machine intelligence. And the paper is famous mostly for the so-called imitation game, which has become known as the Turing test. But actually, this is the most controversial and the least significant part of the, of the article. The main body of the article is really a philosophical analysis of the possibility of machine intelligence in which Turing lists many objections to why machine would be intelligence, and he goes on and he rebuts one after the other. And he concludes by predicting by the end of the century, we will talk about thinking machines. Well, the end of the century, which was 2000, has arrived and gone. I don't think still we talk about our laptop as if they are thinking. So you could say that Turing was probably guilty of some early optimism or over-optimism. And he's not the only one. Many of the pioneers in AI thought, well, OK, give us 10, 15 years, 30 years. How hard can intelligence be? Well, it seems at the end now we know it's a bit harder than, <coughs> than people have thought. And in fact, there were some periods and in which we had so-called AI winters. I mean, the field was making very slow progress. Funding was difficult to obtain. In fact, when I was a graduate student, AI had the artificial intelligence, or AI has a bit of an unsavory flavor to it. You know, it was a field that always over-promised and under-delivered. And then the first big change happened in 1997, 20 years ago. And this was when a program by IBM, a computer and a program by IBM, Deep Blue, beat Kasparov in a chess tournament. And I already, I was, I spent before the 10 years in IBM research, but at that point I was already at Rice, but I had good relationship with IBM, and they invited me and paid my way, paid my way to go to New York and see the, the match. And I, I was there for the first game, and the first game, Kasparov, was white, white typically thought to have an advantage, and Kasparov won the first game. And I was thinking, well, one day computers will win, but it looks as if the time has not come yet, and we were still fairly new in Houston, we didn't have any friends. I left my wife alone in Houston, I said, I'm going back home early. And I did not stay for the second game. The second game, Deep Blue was white, Kasparov was black. Kasparov decided to lay a trap to Deep Blue, a very, a very brilliant trap, and Deep Blue not only did not fall the, into the trap, but find a way to get out of it that was so brilliant that Kasparov for a long time did not accept that he was playing against a machine. He was sure there's a team of grandmasters he was playing against. And eventually he accepted that machines are better than humans now in match. And then the next big milestone after that will be 2011, where again IBM, 
Now, a program called Watson, and now IBM wants to make sure they make money on this progress, so everything IBM now is Watson this and Watson that. And, but this was really an amazing accomplishment. Now Watson uh, uh, played a different type of game. It's a game show, it's called Jeopardy, and it's a game about uh, you have to know culture and history and, and popular culture, and uh, Watson beat two champion players. And it was very impressive because Deep Blue was all about essentially just brute force computation. This was about being really clever. And this was the point in which I started thinking, my goodness, AI maybe is not as far, it used to be always in the far future, so far that we didn't have to think about societal consequences. And now it seems that we must start to think about societal consequences. That's the point in which I start thinking about, about societal issues. Is it that? Okay. Ah, okay. I have to get. Good. And then last year, there was another milestone. Now the mantle has passed to Google, and AlphaGo, which is a Google program, beat listed all the champion Go player in Go. And I'll explain in a minute why this is very, very significant. More significant, for example, than chess. But just before that, I will say there is another, even more recently. It's now in, even in poker. Now, poker, we think it's a player. It's about bluffing. It's about reading people's faces. Now, I will not even play poker against the machine. <laughs> but let's go back to, to Go, OK? So here is the important thing about Go. Chess, you basically computer play chess by searching deep into the game tree. What is the game tree? What are the moves that I can make? and the responses of the opponent, and my responses, and their responses, you get a game three, and Deep Blue was able to search deeper than any human player can foresee, you know, 10 moves into the future. No human players can see 10 moves into the future. Go is, a, in some sense, a simpler game. The board is bigger, and there are more pieces, and you know, the pieces are all just white and, white and black pieces. Therefore, the search tree is just, there are too many configurations for, for to be able to search it mechanically. Even a computer cannot search very deeply. So the program AlphaGo uses a different strategy, and the strategy is called machine learning. And first of all, AlphaGo digested all published games, hundreds of thousands of published games. And then it played mil millions of games against itself to learn what are good positions and what are good moves. And you can say that essentially what AlphaGo has done is develop intuition how to play Go. And it's intuition because the same thing when you ask a, a champion Go player, how do you play, they have a sense. They, don't, they cannot tell you precise rules. They have, they have deep intuition how to play the game. And AlphaGo develops such intuition. The fact that machine today can develop intuition answer an old paradox about AI that was, goes back to the, more than 50 years ago. It was called the Polanyi's paradox. So there are many things that we can do but without being able to explain how we do them. For example, riding bicycle, okay? How do you ride bicycle? Well, if you ride bicycle, the answer is you just sit on top and you pedal. But try to explain to someone else. In fact, you want to have fun, find an adult who cannot ride bicycle and see if you can teach them to ride a bicycle, okay? I'm not sure they will have fun. You may, you, maybe you'll have fun doing that. It's very hard to explain. And if people thought that we'll never be able to teach mach uh, uh, computers to drive, because driving, we do it mostly by intuition. We don't have precise rules when to push the, the gas and when to push the clutch and when to push the brake. We just do it. And in fact, driving has been a grand challenge now for AI for quite a few years. Going back now to the 2005, DARPA decided, DARPA is a defense advanced research project agency in the United States, a Department of Defense, and they decided this is important for the military to be able to automate driving. And the first challenge was in Desert Valley, and a car by Stanford was able to go more than 130 miles in an unrehaired desert trail. Two years before that, no car was able to do more than seven miles. They all turned over, fell into ditches, but two years later, all learned they can do that. And then two years later, it was done, it was the DARPA Urban Challenge, the same thing, autonomous driving, but now in an urban environment, Pittsburgh. And now, I'm sure everybody is familiar with this. This is the, the famous Google car, <laughs> and it uh, looks like we are about to automate driving. 
I just want to put it in some historical context because I consider the automation of driving a real revolution in transportation. And of the same scale of some previous revolutions, so let me just go back in history. This is the fair transportation revolution, right? <laughs> in fact, we still talk to the, the proverbial inventing, reinventing the wheel, it's considered one of the most fundamental human invention, the wheel. And the wheel has been incredible uh, advanced in human civilization. You have to have a fine touch here. You have to have a fine touch. Okay, the pyramids. We would not be able to build the pyramids if we didn't have a way to transport very large pieces of stone and rocks, right? We needed something like that. And then, as far as we can tell, the next big advance is the domestication of the horse. So the wheel is about 5,000 years BC, the horse is about 3,500 years BC, and now we don't have to walk everywhere, which is what we had to do until then. And once you can ride on a horse, ooh, ooh. Uh, I, need, I still didn't get it. Ah. We need the artificial flipper. Right? Okay, the Mongol Empire. Imagine going from Mongolia all the way practically to Europe, just on a horseback. And this is what you can do with once you don't have to walk everywhere. And then the next thing, long time after that, is the, is the steam engine, the steam locomotive. And the steam locomotive is really the kind of the beginning of the initialization of transportation. In particular, if you think the United States, the United States was really, the original United States was really an East Coast country. And then it started expanding, and uh, you think that eventually in the 19th century, the big expansion of the West Coast, you couldn't have a continental country if you don't have the railway. Before that, if you want to go from New York to San Francisco, you have to go all around South America, right? It's very hard to go there, or it took you months to go by land. So the, the train has been an incredibly important advance in the history of the United States. And then, about 100 years later, is the Ford Model T. It's not the first car. The first car is about 50 years before that. But this is the first car that is mass available for mass cons consumption. Suddenly, this has become a very popular car. And the car gave us this. And this. This, the car has been an incredibly important product in, thank you, in the 20th century United States. In fact, you could argue it probably is the most significant industrial product. It laid the, the infrastructure for American industry. In fact, you cannot imagine, uh, if you look at the, at the American industry, you have a, Victory in World War II is enabled by, by having this uh, uh, in, in the industrial infrastructure. And in fact, uh, if you watched uh, American movies, you saw the car culture was there. The car symbolized freedom, adulthood. Even in science fiction movie, we see the future dystopian cars. This is from uh, uh, Mad Max, I think. But the car come with an incredible societal cost. And the costs are every year more than a million people get killed by car crashes. And many of them are people in the middle of their life and the property damage is more than half a trillion dollars. So this is a huge cost that we just have learned to internalize and we, in fact we call it now, we don't call them car crashes, we call them car accidents. If it's an accident, it's some, some act of God, okay? The reality is, who is responsible for more than a million people die every year? Look to the left, look to the right. Okay? We are responsible. The vast majority, about 95% of car crashes, are caused by human error. And therefore, there is a tremendous amount of optimism that automating driving, taking humans out of the equation, 
will save maybe a million lives per year. So, so there is a tremendous now excitement in some areas about automation of driving. There are dozens of companies putting investment in R&D in autonomous driving, and some of them are technology companies. You Google, now actually they spun off this car, the, the company is called Waymo, Tesla, and the like. The car companies, GM, Ford, and the like, many startups, some of the tra new transportation companies, Uber and Lyft, all of them, everybody is now piling because the market is going to be in trillions of dollars. This is a, there is a gold rush mentality around automation of driving. And everybody expect it to happen. People argue whether it's five or 10 or 15 years and how, what kind of autonomy, there are different degrees of autonomy that we are talking about. There are legal issues to resolve. What about liability is there, if there is an accident? who's responsible, the, the, the car owner, the, the software vendor, I mean, who, who is responsible for things? Many legal issues are going to be resolved. It's going to be a huge business disruption. Cars are very inefficient mode of transportation because the privately owned car, my car, does nothing for about uh, 23 and a half hours per day. Its main function is to serve me for 15 minutes in the morning and the evening. And so people talk about the end of car ownership as a standard, and instead of talking about transportation as a service. So this, you know, when you think just of, of eliminating, saving million lives per year, it's hard to think of something that will be, for people who work on this, they say, well, that's our goal. We want to save lives. But then you see this picture. This is the most common job in each state in the United States. And you can see that in the majority of the states, the most common job is a truck driver. So what will happen to truck drivers once you automate driving? And in fact, if you automate driving, you automate, you realize you can automate much more than driving. Okay, you can automate cargo ships, you can automate ports, you can automate warehouses, This is a container terminal in South Korea. You can imagine that this is all containers and we're going to be able to automate ports as well. So what will happen? What will happen to truck drivers? This is the big question. So here there is a big debate. What's going to happen? So on one hand you have kind of what you call neoclassical economist and the neoclassical economist says nothing to worry about. Technology destroys jobs, technology creates new jobs. This happened in the past, will happen in the future, nothing to worry about. This is the neoclassical economist. And then you have the economists who say, no, 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 we are very worried. Technology can, can have really very adverse effect on working class people. So we have the neoclassical, we have the, the new Luddites. One says this time is not different, otherwise says this time it is different. Who is right? <laughs> this has become a very hot topic. And if you follow this, almost every month a new study comes out. And every study that comes out says something different. <laughs> okay, so who, what, what should you believe among all these different studies? Are you a pessimist? You can go to a high figure. If you're an optimist, you can go to 9%. So why is it there are so many different studies on this? Because it's about the future. And the answer is the future is, by definition, unknown. Okay? Making prediction about the future is easy. Making correct prediction about the future is hard. Especially many people make predictions about what will happen in 30 years. In 30 years, I don't expect to be here, so I can make any predictions I want, and you can never come back and challenge me on that. <laughs> so instead of making predictions, I think it's more useful to look at the past. Okay, let's look at the past, and we'll look at the past, let's say instead of looking 30 years into the future, let's, the, let's look about 30 years into the past. Now I'm going to focus, one, about the, on the United States. Why the United States? Well, the United States is still about 25% of the world 
GDP. So it's a pretty big chunk of the world's economy. And it is one of the freest economies, so to speak. Of course, one could argue what's the definition of free economy, but it's a, basically, especially starting from 1980, US governments have taken a very less fair attitude towards the economy, let it run itself and we'll see what happens. The only thing is monetary, mon monetary interference. And the larger sector in the US economy is manufacturing. So if you just listen to politicians, you think the US, US uh, manufacturing is all gone. Everything is went to either to China or to Mexico. But US manufacturing is bigger than Germany, Korea, France, Russia, Brazil, and UK combined. Okay? It's a huge, huge, huge economic sector. So let's, look, let's take this sector and see how it has responded to technology of the past generation. And here is, in some sense, one picture that says it all. This is very important. This is very important for you to realize what's going on here, OK? Let me see if I can use the pointer. No? Ooh, OK, bad idea. Now it just keeps going and going. Can we stop it now? I can stop it. How do I stop it? Okay. Now it keeps stopping. Okay. He's taking it where it was. I hope so. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Good. So, red line. I'm, not, I'm trying to be careful. Red line. Maybe if I can point there, can you flip when I tell you? Let's try that. This, um, this is not very good. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, red line is volume in constant dollars. What you see is that youth manufacturing is essentially at an all-time high. It's been going, other than the usual zigzag that you see with economic activity, it's been going up since the late 40s. It's been going up. There was some decline after the war, after the, because a lot of output that was related to the war effort. But now we're after 40, 47, we're going up. But now let's what happened to employment. Employment peaked at about uh, the left side is, is volume. The right side is employment. We are about 19 and a half million people around 1980. And now we have lost about uh, 7 million jobs since then, eight, seven and a half million jobs since then. So more than one third jobs have been lost, okay? Now why? Next. Here is another way to look at it. As a share of the real GDP, it's pretty constant. It hasn't really changed for many, many years. But when you look at employment, 1960 used to be 25%. If you go back, in fact, uh, at the end of World War II, it's about 45%. And it's been going down. Now it's about 8% of the people are working in, in manufacturing. Next. Why? Very simple. Manufacturing works have become more productive. It's all about productivity. You can see here that in just in the past 20 years, we have more than doubled the productivity of, of a man, in manufacturing. Which generally we think this is good news, right? We would like the economy to become more productive. Next. This is today, if you can Google and find this picture. It's the Tesla Model S factory somewhere in, in the South United States. You see it's a beautiful factory floor. There's one thing you don't see here. In fact, there used to be an old joke in GM. They said the factory of the future will have machines, a, a man, and a dog. <laughs> the dog will watch that the, the man does not touch the machines, <laughs> and the man will feed the dog. <laughs> Next. So now, now we can look, and it says, OK, here is a sector that clearly has already uh, under, under, uh, has, has undertaken a fair amount of automation. So what happened to, to the people who used to work there? So the story that we should have from economists was no problem. These people would have found other jobs, right? What I'm going to show you in the rest, in, in, in exacting details, is actually working class people in the United States has been very adversely affected by technology. 
I give this talk mostly in, in to academic audiences, and people find it very surprising. They knew nothing about it. And the reason we usually know nothing about it is because I would say it's people like us live in a bubble. And I call it the educated professional bubble. Because you and your family members and the people you associate with, the people you talk to, are all essentially benefiting, benefiting from this modern, technology-rich econ econ economy. And we really don't associate much and don't talk much to people outside our own bubble. And that bubble is, in the United States, is about 25% uh, of the population. I suspect in Brazil the numbers are a bit different, but the same bubble essentially exists. Next. So I'll try to show you two slides that, in some sense, will summarize it. So there are four key indicators if you try to uh, wonder about economic growth and prosperity. The thing that drives economic growth is productivity increase. We become more productive, and the economy grows. Economy grows, the GDP, and what you like to see are new jobs being created, and you like to see income grow. And indeed, there was a period of about 30 years at the end of World War II, 30, 35 years, in which these four numbers were moving together, and economists call it the great coupling. And in fact, they were moving so much in tandem that you would think that this is an economic law. If you increase productivity, the economy grows, you generate new jobs, and income, income rise, rises. Next. But this is, if you go back to roughly 1980, you can see there is a divergence, which has been now called the great decoupling. And this divergence means that we're still increasing productivity, and the economy grows, but we are not creating as many jobs as we used to create, and income is not growing as much as it used to grow. So the economy as a whole grows, but it doesn't benefit everyone in the same way. Next. And in fact, you want to see how much it does not benefit everyone in the same way. This looks at the median yearly income of white men with no college degree. This is a fairly large group. And as you may have noticed lately, they have non-trivial political power. And what you see is between 1975 to 2015, the real income, real means adjusted for inflation, has declined. So it used to be when you saw on TV kind of angry men, they usually were someone in the Middle East, and they usually say something like death to the United States. But over the past year, we're seeing them in rallies in the United States. And you see these angry men, you wonder, what are they so angry about? Isn't life good? No, for them, life has not been good. That's what they're angry about. Next. And we've been hearing, especially since 2014, when uh, Thomas Piketty's book uh, came out, we've been hearing a lot about inequality. And we can see how, indeed, over the past, uh, again, 30 plus years, the bottom 90% has not done very well. While if you go to the top 10%, the top 1%, top 0.1%, and the 1% of the 1%, much of the, of the income has gone to these people. Next. I think this puts it in even a sharper contrast. So the blue one is the bottom 50%. And the red one, or the orange one, is the, bottom, is the top 1%. And you can see, if you go back 50 years, the top 1% earned about 12%, and the bottom 50% earned about 20%. And we are seeing now, as this has been going on, you can see roughly it started sometimes in the early 70s. And it's, we're seeing an inversion. Okay? Now the top 1% are making about 20%, and the bottom 50% are making about 12%. 12%. Next. Now, inequality is a huge topic. And it's important in the United States. It's probably even more important here in Brazil. Now, in the US, there is this particular slogan. Whenever you talk about inequality, you're accused of being jealous, of envious, and you say, look, these people at the top, they worked hard, they're smart, it's meritocracy. You should not mind that other people are getting rich. But we have ample data to show that it's bad for country to have high inequality. For example, even in the United States, people want to have equality of opportunity, and they care about social mobility, the ability of people to rise above their the, the level in which they were born. But the data shows very clearly that if you have higher inequality, you have lower mobility. Okay? So at the high end, you have like uh, US, this is, uh, I think, OECD countries, so I don't see Brazil here. 
but in, you have the high end, you have US, Spain, UK, these are country, high con countries with high inequality and low mobility. And the Scandinavian countries are the opposite, low inequality and high mobility. Next. This put it, I think, more starkly. The question is, take a 30-year-old. Are they doing better than their parents? And generally, what do, what do parents want to see? They want to see their children doing better than them. And if you go back to, again, to the, to the 19, 1940, you have a chance, you have more than 90% chance to do better than your parents. And what's happened? Again, now we have decline, 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 and we have, uh, again, lower mobility. Now, now if you're 30 years old, your chances of, of uh, doing better than your parents are now about 50%. Next. And even economic growth suffers as a result. And the reason the economic growth suffers as a result, because um, for many of the countries, the economic growth is consumer, it's a consumer driven. And who are the people who can consume a lot? Typically, it's the middle class. The people at the very top, there are too few of them. Even the average, there are too few of them to really consume enough. The people at the bottom cannot consume enough. The middle class is the one that does the consumption. And again, we can see that higher inequality means lower economic growth. In effect, in the United States, we have had, for the past generation, lower economic growth. Next. And the perception is, in most Western countries, is the, the middle class is the bulwark of democracy. Okay? These are the people that uh, have enough time to think about governance and whom to vote for. And what we are seeing now, this is self-identification. This asks people, how do you identify yourself with? And we see that the people who identify as upper class, the numbers are going down, and the middle class are going down, and more and more people think of themselves as working class people. So the middle class is shrinking. If you look at income, this is really supported also by fig figure on actual income. Next. And in fact, there is now, you know, I mean, when I was growing up, the phrase was America was referred to some promised land where there's gold in the street. But when you look today at people in the United States, there is tremendous amount of what we call precariousness. So they ask people, can you handle an unexpected expense, what was the first one, of $400? And 47% of the people say they have no reserve, they cannot cope with $400 uh, level of expense. And if you raise it to $1,000, then two thirds of the people say, I have no way of dealing with it. Now, $1,000 in the United States is if the transmission of your car breaks down, it may cost you about $1,000 to replace your transmission. If you, if you cannot do that, if you, if you don't have a car, you may lose your job. If you lose your job, you may not be able to make payments on your house, and may, you may lose your house. So we have lots of people who are $1,000 away from becoming homeless because they have, they have no cushion, they have no reserves. Next. So this is, this is one of the slides, again, that when I saw that, it took my breath away. So we all hear about unemployment. Unemployment measures how many people who are looking for a job are not finding jobs. And unemployment now in the United States is below 4.5%. It's actually very, very good. And politicians love to, to say, look, this is great. But there are two ways to lower unemployment. One by more people finding jobs, but the other one is by fewer people looking for jobs. So here is what happened if you look at men. These are men between 25 and 54. So these are people that are beyond their education, that are before even early retirement. And for these people used to be, you see that labor poor participation, which measures how many of them are in the workforce, either working or looking for a job, it used to be 97%. This is what men used to do. And you see it's been going down now for the past 50 years. Now, I'm focusing, on, I'm focusing on males because for women, the picture is more complicated. First, you see a period of rise where women, women are, are joining the workforce. It's also going, do, going down now. But for men, it's just very, very clear. It's been going down now for 50 years. Next. It gets even starker when you, when, you, when you break it in by education. And you see that for people with bachelor degree, it also went down, but not, not dramatically. But people for high school or less, which is about two-thirds of the people in the United States, it's now at about 80, 82%. And 
And what this means is that if you look also at the people who are not working, about somewhere between one in five or maybe even one in four working class men in the United States is not working. And this is just, to me, was when I realized it was a shocking number because typically we think a country in deep economic crisis, you know, if you think about the United States, depression style crisis with 25 unemployment rate. But in some sense, what you have now is for working, working class men, they, are hit, they have been hit by economic depression. Next. And the same thing you see among young men. These are men between 20, 21 and 30. And you see that more than 20, 20, 20, 20 percent of them have not held a job in the past year. Now, this is a very influential decade of people's life because that's when they are joining the workforce. And for many, work, for many people like us, professionals, we don't realize the two most important job skills. Show up on time, do what your boss tells you to do. Now, we take it for granted because we have been living in a system where you do what the professor told you, you do your homework, so we have these skills that to us come very naturally. If you're not working in your, in your 20s, you're, not, you're probably not going to ever have been able to hold what we would call a normal job. Next. Now, this is just one touch. I'm mostly focusing on economics, but I want to tell you that these economic figures have, have broader consequences. One of the things we're seeing now in the United States is the collapse of marriage among working class people. And uh, so in, this is all over all. In the United States, 40% of the people are now born out of wedlock. If you look again at working class people, it's about 50%. And one explanation is that young men who are, not, who, who are not working, do not have a job, are not good marriage material. <laughs> it's another mouth to feed. So they're still useful for certain things, <laughs> like having children, but, but marriage is out, is out of the picture for them. And having a large population of unemployed, unmarried men is the recipe for trouble. If you don't believe it, look at the Middle East. Okay? Next. And you can look at, again at microeconomic figures. You look at labor share of the economy. So this used to be for many, many years 50%. And now, again, for more than 40 years now, it's been declining. And many, many papers are written trying to explain why is it declining? What's going on? Why is labor losing to capital? Next. So let's now try to, I've shown you kind of all these dismal figures about what's happening, especially to working class people. Now let's do a deeper analysis of what's going on. So labor economies are calling this job polarization. And what they mean, if you look at a high skill job and you measure high skill by just how much money they make, usually the economy rewards people for their skill. If you look at a high end job, then these jobs are right now, they're not in risk of, uh, of automation. And so, in fact, we're seeing more jobs generated at the high end. If you look at the very low end, think of uh, cleaning tables in a restaurant. We don't have the technology today to develop a robot that can step into a restaurant and uh, lift you know, wine glasses without breaking them and not step on people's toes. And how much do we pay the people who do that job? In the United States, we pay the minimum wage. They get paid very little. There, there's no economic incentive to automate these jobs. So we're not automating, we're creating jobs at the low end, we're creating jobs at the high end, but in the middle, we're losing jobs. These are middle skill jobs. What are middle skill jobs? Manufacturing was a middle skill job. Driving is a middle skill job. Next. And the right way to look at these jobs is, and again, labor economies classify all jobs on two major axes. Is it cognitive or is it manual? Are you working with your head? Are you working with your hands? But most significant, is it routine or not routine? And the jobs we're going to we are automated, we have been automating for the past 30, 40 years, are the routine jobs. So if you see what job are we creating, non-routine, cognitive, and non-routine manual, we're creating such jobs. We're losing jobs that are routine. Next. And again, you can look at it by, by education. So if you look at uh, people with a bachelor degree, we're creating new jobs. People without high school, high school education, we're losing jobs, and in the middle, it's flat. Next. 
and you can again look at it by income. And you see that people with advanced degrees, this is beyond baccalaureate, master or PhD or professional degrees, the income grows up. For college, the income grows up. College and high school, it's about flat, and less than high school again, we see lower, lower income. Next. Here is the, the, the other, I think, uh, other uh, piece of data that, again, I found shocking. And this came out just about two years ago. And this looked at mortality, mortality of people between 45 and 54. And this is in the period 1990 to 2010. And generally, healthcare, with all the noise about it, healthcare is getting better. And the mortality goes down. And this is true almost in any country in the world. And it's true for every demographic group, ex except there is one glaring exception. And this is US white. And when you look at US white, mortality is rising. And you ask, why are they dying more? What is killing them? Well, major, the major thing that are killing them have to do with suicide and drug, drug overdose and liver diseases. These are all called diseases of despair. These are people that usually have lost hope and therefore they are, they are engaged in self-destructive activities. And so everybody is now talking openly about the opioid epidemic among working class Americans. Next. And there is, the Washington Post has come up with a, a just about a year ago, found a nice, interesting correlation between, between this mortality and between voting for Donald Trump. Next. And so here is, here's another one. This looks at a, one axis is, is health, health indicator, and the other axis have to do with uh, are you Republican or Democrat? And the, the healthier you are, the more, the, this is county by county, the healthier you are, the more you tend to vote Democratic. If you have low health, then the more you tend to vote Demo, the Republican. There is a very direct correlation there. <laughs> Next. Another analysis is by, and this is even going back to 2012, they, they, they analyze the jobs in every county. Are these routine jobs? Are these non-routine jobs? If the jobs are routine, you're going to vote Republican. If the vote are non-routine, you're going to vote Democrats. Okay? Next. So here, this is a very famous quote. I want to see who recognizes it. All that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profane. And man is at last compelled to, to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. Anybody? Communist Manifesto for Marx and Engels, right? So this is, this is the, the, about 100 years after the Industrial Revolution started, and we know that for the first 100 years, there was very adverse consequences for working people, and the time we're facing today are reminiscent of what, uh, what happened then. Next. Now, is this caused by automation? Well, in economics especially, we cannot run experiment. So it's very, very hard to parse different factors and to determine causality. What's causing this? People say globalization, uh, financialization, decline of unions, all kind of things that you can attribute it. But already in 2014, there was a plurality of economics that says autom automation is at least a major factor. And I suspect if you do the same poll now, this would be a majority. Because people now have come to the conclusion that automation is a major factor. Next. So one of the questions is, well, technology is nothing new. I mean, the whole arc of human history is about develop, developing technology. What's different than this, this time? Well, the answer is that every time that we, invent, we made a new technology, humans had to move to something where they have competitive advantage. This is the key thing. You have to find something that you are better than machines. As the machines get better and better, it's harder and harder to find things that we are better. In fact, if people like me are successful, that's what we are doing. We are trying to become better and better and better. More and more tasks that used to be in, in, in intrinsically human 
machines can do better than, than humans now. Take face recognitions. People are very, very, very good at recognizing faces. Well, guess what? Machines can do it better than us now. Next, trying to make predictions, let's say 1700. What happened? You said in the past uh, many hundreds of years, economic growth was very slow. Suddenly, poof. So if you try to make predictions in 1700, you'll make very lousy predictions. Because in 50 years, suddenly you'll see that, that economic growth picks up very quickly. Next. This has to do with innovation. We can see, remember, we invented the, the, the wheel 5,000 years BC, but somebody has not counted innovation. And we see again that we see a tipping point somewhere around, around 1700. We see that we are peaking technologically. Next. This is a beautiful uh, parable due to a famous economist, uh, Vasily Leontiev. And in this parable, there are two, there are two horses. It's 1915, and the horses are having a discussion. And one horse heard about the Ford Model T. And this horse is the new Luddite horse, and this horse is very worried. And he says, I hear about these new uh, cars, there will be no jobs for horses. And the other horse is neoclassical, and he said, don't worry. There are always new jobs for horses. Technology destroys jobs for horses, and it creates new jobs for horses. Nothing to worry about. As it happened, who was right? The new Luddite horse was right, because 1915, was peak horse population in the United States. We still have horses today, but they are essentially pets, okay? In terms of jobs, there are no more jobs for horses, very much so. Next. So, yes, of course technology creates new jobs. But the question is, does it create enough jobs? Does it create them at the right speed that it destroys them? And most importantly, what are the skill levels that are being created? If I take now a truck driver, that has been driving for 20 years and now lost uh, his job, usually it's his job, because of automation of driving. And I tell you, you know, don't worry. There are new jobs. We need people who write software for autonomous cars. What is the likelihood I can take a truck driver and move that up the skill ladder to where the new skills are needed? Not very likely. Next. Uh, here is another way to look at it. If you go back just about 25 years ago, the center of American industry was Detroit. If you take the big three in Detroit, their market value was about $65 billion. They employed more than a million people. Now the center of American industry is Silicon Valley. You take the big three, which is uh, Google and Apple and Facebook, and their market valuation is one and a half trillion dollars. It's about 20 times more. They employed less than 200,000 people. And so we are not creating enough jobs and not at the right skill levels. Next. And to me, it's actually very depressing. We went through an election campaign, and this issue was nowhere on the horizon. What did Trump talk about? He talked about trade. Why did he talk about trade? Because automation is a very abstract force, and you can blame anyone, and it's not clear what to do about it. So if you want to blame someone, it better be, first of all, people rather than abstract forces. And it's even better if these people look differently than you. That's even easier to blame them, OK? The only politician who was talking about this is President Obama. He wasn't running for office, so he, he uh, and he's uh, quite knowledgeable about what's going on. And he said it's about automation. And more significantly, this is not going to stop. And we better think how to adapt to it. Next. So much of what we think now about how we, we manage our, our labor life was a development that started roughly from the middle of the 19th century and took about 100 years for this to fully mature. Things that we take for granted, like the right to strike, the right to unionize, abolish child labor, the 40-hour work week, equal pay, health and safety laws. And now we're saying this is not enough. There's a hot topic that people are discussing. It's called universal, universal basic income which is everybody will get, eliminate all welfare programs. Everybody gets some level of support from the state. This is a very interesting proposal. It has proponents on the left and on the right, has opponents on the left and on the right, and we're going to hear much about it in the coming years. Next. So let me conclude. 
This is a quote from Jason Furman, who was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors of President Obama. And he issued a report just about uh, less than a year ago. And he said, my worry is not that this time could be different than it comes to AI, but that this time could be the same as what we had for the past generation. Thank you very much. Mais uma vez, agradecer ao professor a, a Moshe Vard pela excelente palestra, né? e, e temos um, alguns minutos para perguntas né? do, a, a, da, da, audi, do, da audiência, aqui, das pessoas aqui. Aparentemente, você pode perguntar em português e eu vou ouvir em inglês, se funciona. Eu espero que funciona melhor do que isso. Very challenging talk. Thank you. Uh, from what you have said, I think we are heading towards a great depression because the rate of A against B will not be able to prevent it. And second thing uh, from the beginning of your talk, can you comment something about the creation of emotions by artificial machines? So there is a, this is an area of research. People call it emotive computing. And it has a, two aspects to it. One is express, expressing emotions. And so there are people at MIT that build emotive robots. And these robots have faces that are kind of childish, big eyes. And they do very exaggerated uh, gestures and expressions. And as a result, when you talk to them, you can very clearly read their emotions. I mean, it's very, I mean, these are all very exaggerated, almost cartoon-like, but because of that, they can actually express emotions. The other part, in which some people say that robots or machines in general will become, in fact, even better than human, is being able, again, to do a massive amount of machine learning and uh, being able to read faces. So we actually, typically, most people are quite good you know, and can tell the difference between an, a smiley face and an angry face. What we are not very good at is capturing micro, micro expressions. So some people actually are very good at controlling their face. I mean, look at Putin's face, okay? A KGB face, right? Always, no expression on his face, okay? He's been trained now for years. Apparently, even people who are like trained to not have any expression, they have a micro expression that they very quickly suppress, and it's not visible to the human eye usually. But we can expect actually machines to become very, very good at reading people's emotion. This is very much active research area. We will see how this unfolds. Nós temos mais uma pergunta ali. Nós temos aqui na UFRJ um laboratório que estuda emoções, inteligência artificial e propõe essa interação entre o humano e a máquina para nós não, talvez, sermos descartados. É, uma pergunta é, por que não criar é, taxas sobre o total do faturamento que está aumentando das empresas da, e, e sobre os robôs? Talvez só a gente consiga se aposentar no futuro ou ter uma vida boa se a gente conseguir fazer isso. E a outra pergunta é a renda básica, que a Finlândia, mais uma vez, está tentando aplicar para a base de todos os seus cidadãos. Então, se a gente, como cientistas, pessoal da tecnologia, não propor isso, talvez ninguém vá propor. I hear nothing here. Can you summarize the question to me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he's, asking, he's asking about uh, 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 what kind of uh, uh, tax could be uh, applied to robots in order to uh, balance this uh, 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 problem of displacing humans from, from uh, 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 normal activities. We are now at the very beginning of thinking how to handle this, this uh, phenomenon that we are seeing here. So 
I would say is almost until, until about a year ago, there was still a big debate. Is it really true? Is automation really having this impact or not? Many people say, no, it's not automation. Especially after, as a result of Brexit, and then Trump winning the nomination, and then Trump winning the election, a lot of people were very surprised, and a lot of people says, what the dot, 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 four letters is going on? <laughs> and suddenly there is much more attention now to the working class people, and much more data comes out, people are realizing this is going on. We are only at the very beginning of time to, to think about, okay, what do we do about this? And so there are really not many, many good answers. I mentioned universal basic income. Um, you can think of universal, Robotax is a version of universal basic income, but essentially it's trying to address the, the balance is that what we have seen is labor is declining and capital is going up. So if you look now at the economy and you break it into essentially labor and capital, capital seems to be going up, okay? So technology seems to be winning. I mean, this is really what Marx used to believe. It seemed to be happening now more than it happened in his time. And the question is, how do we bring it back into balance? And it would, it's clear that if we just let the market do it by itself, it's not going to happen. Partly there is, of course, it's a fallacy that the free market is some natural construct. It's not. It's a human construct. I mean, human establish all the rules of the, of the free market. Every ins everything that you say about it is money, contracts, the like. It's all human, uh, human construct. And we will have to rethink our whole, not just our labor laws, but whole socioeconomic life. Because we have a system that is now based on that for the vast majority of the people, you know, I would say probably 90 plus percent, we work to make a living, okay? We work to make a living, which was the natural human condition from since we were expelled out of the Garden of Eden, right? We had to work to make a living. And this assumed that there will be jobs, at least for the greatest majority of the people. We understand there are always going to be some people who cannot find jobs, but most people were able to find jobs. What happens if, if this assumption breaks down? And so this was really, this assumption has really been serving us now for thousands of years. If you work, you can make a living. You just have to be willing to work. And now it's not clear that this assumption will continue with us. We're already seeing now that for 20%, 20 percent, 20 plus percent of American working class men, this is not working. And so Robotax is just one, one particular policy that now people are starting to, to debate. And I think we will, this will emerge, I predict. The only prediction I'm willing to make is that this will stay now as a bigger and bigger and bigger domestic policy issues, maybe the most significant domestic policy is issues in, in not only developed countries, but more and more in developing countries. Because one thing you need to remember is that what's happening here? Why do you see more automation? Cost of machines is going down. Cost is going down, capability is going up. So what happened in manufacturing? We paid manufacturing workers 20 to $30 an hour. As soon as robots, when you amortize it, was cheaper than that, it's now about $15 an hour, the jobs go there. The cost of robots continue to go down. And so what will happen if we start to be able to make shirts using robots? What's, what are people in Bangladesh going to do? Okay, this is, I'm sure this will have huge implication on, on Brazil. When you look again at the skill level of people, at the level of the industry, at the end of the day, industry just does one computation. What's the cheapest way to manufacture to do things? Okay. What about scientific research? Will it be done by machines in the lifetime of people who are alive today? So, I, I, to, to a certain extent, it's already machine. A lot of scientific research is done by machines. Okay, I was I was an undergraduate. My undergraduate major was in physics. And then I decided to switch from my graduate degree to computer science. And one reason is because I saw what all the graduate students in physics were doing. They're all sitting in the computer and running, running, running programs. So I just said, I might as well just go and uh, study this phenomenon more than study physics. That's where, that's where I switched. And so more and more uh, research is done by, by computation, by simulation. Think of what happened in astronomy. Digital astronomy has become a huge thing over the past decade. And before that, you, you wanted to do an experiment, you, you, you wanted to study something, you thought of an experiment, it took a long time to do that. Now the answer is, first of all, gather the data. 
Just gather data as much as you can. Put in databases. Very often your experiment is running a query on a relational database. And so much of it is still, it's still driven by, by humans. I mean, what machines are not good and really have not made any progress is let machines come up with new concepts. To me, the most brilliant scientific advance that we make is we invent new concepts. And so far, we are very, very far away from machine inventing new concepts. But we are uh, automating more and more aspects of science. Bem, queria mais uma vez agradecer e pedir a vocês todos agradecer o professor Moshe Vardi pela palestra.